Hi, uh, I'm Nika, I'm David's wife, um, and this is an event in honor, in the honor of uh, the first anniversary of David Graeber's passing, and in the spirit of his rejection of academic arrogance and our urgent need to get out of the crisis we are in, we set up the art project, Fight Club. Welcome to the first one of the series. Today we are talking about what is debt. The next one will be about the nature of money. David was probably the most famous anthropologist of our times and the best-selling author. Even still, he had a fold in his computer called Nightmare, in which he dumped all bills, bureaucratic papers, invoices, and uh, papers of his academic achievements. He regards the idea of isolated individual as a myth. What interested David much more was a dialogue. He believed that it is only in dialogue, in the clash of opinions, where answers are formed and our human consciousness is born. We humans, according to David, are the product of our social relationship. That's why it was so important for him to be involved in a situation in which people think and act collectively. In David Graeber Foundation will follow the same path. So we have several projects lined up from collective editing of his archive to publishing the anthology of the Fight Club, starting from the first debate between David Graeber and Peter Thiel. As Fight Club official cheerleader, I urge our fighters to be emotional, provocative, and bold, because the questions that we'll discuss concern us all. If enough of us will change the way we think about what debt mean, then the social design of our society will change, al change along with this. So this is just that, as David described, what a revolution is, a change of common sense and the collective imagination. And David argued that the main achievement of the Paris Commune, despite a defeat, had been the transformation of the common sense in about how we live together. So most of what we consider ordinary in our cities, public transportation, street lights, public schools, the eight hours, work days, and even the not yet achieved equal pay for women and men originated in the Paris Commune. And it was then considered to be a social madness. So the same can be say, said about Occupy, those 10 anniversary we celebrated now, just as we celebrate David's life. Occupy didn't take over any territory, it didn't have leaders in government, but it did change the public discourse. It's become important to talk about equality, poverty and death. So after, after Occupy, we all look at the world differently. Speaking on death, the position of our fighters today are radically different. We want to I want to express my immense gratitude to Thomas Piketty, who replied to my email, although we didn't know each other, and agreed to participate in this debate. I also want to thank Michael Hudson, who came up with the, many of the ideas that David Graeber built upon in his book, 5,000 Years of Death. And I really hope that this debate can radically change the way we think about the world. And what else could be more exciting? So I, I pass to Lynn, who uh, thank you for agreeing to moderate this discussion. Well, it's my great pleasure, and it's wonderful to welcome everyone from all over the world. Uh, we share some commonalities in our human experience, and one of them is that we tend to come into the world, most of us, uh, sort of undercapitalized for the experience. Uh, so in a sense, most of us are united in debt, and that's why it's especially exciting to have two such brilliant thinkers help us unpack this difficult subject uh, from the suitcase where we like to push it way into the back of the closet. Um, today, I'm very delighted to welcome my friend, Michael Hudson. He is a distinguished professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, he's also a researcher at the Levy Institute at Bard. He's a former Wall Street analyst and a frequent commenter on economic matters and historical matters. Um, he's written extensively about debt, and as you just heard from Nika, his work was a great inspiration for David Graeber. 
Um, he can also tell you more about the ancient Sumerians than you ever dreamed of knowing. So hopefully we get to hear a little bit about that today. Uh, welcome, Professor Hudson. And welcome also to Tama Piketty. He is the um, professor at the E.H. ESS and the Paris School of Economics, and he's also the co-director of the World Inequality Lab. Uh, you know him for going viral with his books telling us why most of us don't have any money. Um, of course, there was his smash hit, Capitalism in the 21st Century, and uh, more recently, uh, which you must get if you haven't read it, Capitalism and Ideology. Uh, welcome to you, Professor Piketty. And we'll start out having each of you tell us uh, your thoughts about debt, your position on the topic. And you'll have about five minutes each. And uh, I think we'll start with you, Professor Hudson. I thought we were going to have Tom go first. Otherwise, well, it's going to be that. saying That's fine. That's uh, fine. all the things I agree with that he wrote and let him say what, uh, okay. what he wrote. That's fine with me. Tom, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, whatever is is fine. I mean, so okay. Let let me say a few words first. Let me you know thank you for organizing this and and you know I was very uh, you know when I received Nika's email uh, you know I, I felt you know we, you know I felt very emotional because you know I remember very well the discussion we had with David uh, Graber uh, back uh, in 2013 in Paris, which was right after my book, Capital in the 21st Century, was first published in French. It was not yet available in English, so David has, had not read it, but I had read his book on, on debt, um, the first uh, 10,000 years. And and, um, and and this was, you know, this was for me, this was really a very, um, um, uh, you know, powerful uh, reading, and this made me think a lot. Maybe it was not so visible in Capital in the 21st Century, because I had written it actually before I I could read uh, David's book, but but you know, to me this was this was really a major, and this is a major contribution. So, what about that? Let let me simply say that uh, you know there will be in the future there will be again other uh, debt cancellation, massive debt cancellation. So you know there are long cycles about debt, which which of course David uh, talks about when we go back to ancient history or to Sumerian times and as, as Michael uh, has, has been um, has been working on and so you have this long run cycle but you also have uh, you know a short more short run history of, of debt conciliation a more or medium run history if you want and I think it's very important to to, to remember in particular that you know after uh, you know, there are two, two modern uh, episodes which I find particularly striking in terms of uh, getting debt back to zero or at least, you know, cancelling a big part of debt. The French Revolution, of course, is a very important example. So, you know, the, this was a, a time when the, basically the political system did not manage to make pay those who should have paid for the public spending, which was the nobility. So there was a, a fight, a flight toward debt because the people who should have paid the tax were, uh, managed somehow to escape. And the solution was the French Revolution, the end of fiscal privileges of the aristocracy, the cancellation of debt through partly through inflation, partly through taxation. Uh, and that's sort of one modern episode. The other modern episode, which I want to to, to refer to, is of course uh, after World War Two. Uh, you know, after you know, in 1945-1950, most rich economies had public debt, which were uh, enormous. You know, even even before, bigger than than uh, than today, and they made the choices. Uh, you know, the political choice through, you know, very conflictual uh, social movement, political fights. In the end, the choice was made collectively not to repay this debt. So this happens in various ways, you know, inflation in some cases, but, but some countries like uh, Germany in particular, uh, which is viewed today as, as very conservative in terms of economic doctrine and ideology, and which in many ways is, is very conservative. We'll see after the election in a few days, but, uh, you know, it's, it's still uh, going to be quite conservative probably in any case. But in fact, after World War II, uh, developed, applied a solution uh, uh, to, to get rid of the debt of the past through uh, um, a monetary reform and through progressive taxation of very high wealth holders in order to, in effect, compensate the lower wealth holders for the, for the 
uh, for the monetary reform and the, the, the loss of holding that was implied by monetary reform. So that in the end, I mean, this is not the, this was certainly not a perfect system, but as compared to all other ways of getting rid of past debt, you know, this was um, certainly one of the, the one of the most equitable or at least least or least unequitable way to to address the problem. Um, And, you know, I think we will have uh, we will have other episodes like this in the future. So nobody knows the form it will take, you know, the kind of political mobilization, uh, uh, you know, Occupy uh, was, 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 was an important episode. There will be other, uh, you know, there are other, uh, you know, social movement, uh, tax revolt. You know, if you think of the Yellow Vest movement in France a couple of years ago, which was a major tax revolt to get rid of a very... Uh, what I think was a very uh, uh, unequal uh, uh, project to raise uh, carbon tax on the, basically on the poorest group in society. Um, um, and, and there will be, you know, to address uh, climate uh, challenges, but also, you know, all sorts of social and developmental uh, challenges. Uh, we will, we, you know, societies will have to, 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 to find ways uh, Of, of getting rid of their debt. Right now, we have this illusion uh, that, uh, you know, we can just take it on the, on the central bank offer and, and forget about it. But, you know, I think it will be more conflictual and more uh, less peaceful than this because it's always a matter in the end of redefining uh, power relation between different social groups. So it cannot be completely peaceful. It, it, it involves uh, uh, conflicting social interests. It involves involves different uh, groups of people with different uh, agenda. And, uh, you know, in many ways, we, have, we are in a situation uh, which is not, I think, completely different from the one at the time of the French Revolution, which is that, the, you know, those who, those who should pay uh, have somehow managed to design a legal system and a political system so that they can escape uh, taxation. And, uh, and at the same time, middle class and lower class people are Uh, you know, fed up of paying the bill for them, and so and so the, the solution is more and more debt. But you know, at some point, there will have to be something else will have to happen, and I think it will be roughly the same. Uh, it will have to be roughly the same solution as uh, what it was, uh, you know, 200 years ago, which is the end of uh, of fiscal privileges of uh, of uh, a small group in the population that has uh, that has managed to escape uh, taxation for 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 too long. So that's okay. That's a sort of initial uh, initial perspective on, on on that. But you know, of course, I'd be very interested to hear uh, Michael and continue the discussion. Thank you, Michael. It's uh, floor is yours. Okay. Well, I certainly appreciated uh, the the book that you published uh, on the uh, accumulation of uh, wealth and uh, how it's concentrated in the hands of the uh, 1%. I think everybody knew intuitively that this was the case, but uh, economists being who they are, they don't really accept something until it's all there in statistics. And uh, you, you did uh, just a wonderful job in tying together uh, all of these statistics and uh, showing how, the degree to which wealth is Uh, the one percent had concentrated wealth in every country. And you also made, I think, the most important point where you said, what's caused this? And you came up with the broad answer that I agree with. You said that financial returns exceed the overall rate of growth. And if financial returns exceed the overall rate of growth, of course, you're going to have the rich getting uh, richer uh, and richer. Uh, and I think the reason... Uh, where we uh, uh, ha have a different approach is, how do you explain all of this? Well, uh, when your book came out, a number of writers said, well, this is uh, uh, the marks of the uh, uh, 20th century. And uh, uh, you showed that there was an abrupt turning point uh, in 1980, and uh, everything had been changed there. And I think the 1% looked at your statistics as a success story. They said, yep, we're really... Uh, doing better than everybody else. And as uh, the head of Goldman Sachs said, that's because we're so uh, productive. Uh, but I think the reason your book was praised so much uh, in the West is you didn't come up with a threatening political solution. Uh, and uh, when they said this was the Mark book is the Marx for modern time, that meant don't read Marx, read this book. And I suspect that after you put 
all of this enormous good work into the uh, uh, statistics that you did on wealth and income, I think the publisher probably said, well, what are, what are your solutions? Well, you just came up with uh, uh, the solution that you uh, said in the book, and that's to tax income and wealth. Uh, this is not a threatening solution because there's no way that you're going to tax wealth as long as you have offshore banking centers to conceal wealth, as long as uh, you have what the oil industry put in place 100 years ago, the flags of convenience, pretending to make their uh, income abroad. The fact is, uh, the 1% don't really make much income. They're ideal. If you're a, vi a billionaire, you want to do what uh, half of American corporations do. You don't make a penny of taxable income. Uh, that, that's uh, the whole problem. So I want to go into what uh, your book was not about. Uh, I'm not criticizing you for not writing a different book, but it's, the, it's what I write about. And that is, why, what is it that has created this uh, uh, disparity and why has it widened so much since 1980? Well, the most obvious reason is uh, interest rates reached a peak of 20% in uh, 1980, and they've gone down ever since. Well, in the late 1970s, uh, my old boss's boss at Chase Manhattan, Paul Volcker, said, let's raise interest ra rates to a very high because the 99% are getting too much income. Their wages are going up. Let's uh, raise interest to slow the economy, and that will prevent wages from going up. And he did, and that was a large uh, uh, reason why Carter lost the, the uh, election to Ronald Reagan. Interest rates then went down from 20% to almost 0% today. The result was the largest bond market boom in history. Bonds went way up in price. The economy was flooded with bank credit. And most of this credit, uh, apart from going into the bond market, went into real estate. And there is a uh, symbiosis between finance and real estate, and also between finance and raw materials, and also uh, like oil and gas and minerals uh, extraction, natural resource rent, land rent, and also monopoly rent. And most of the monopoly rent has come from the privatization that you had from Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and the whole neoliberalism. Uh, if you look at how did this 1% get most of its wealth? Well, if you look at the Forbes list of the billionaires in almost every country, they got wealth in the old fashioned way, from taking it from the public domain. In other words, privatization. You had the largest privatization and transfer of wealth from the public sector to uh, the private sector, and specifically to the financial sector uh, in, in history. Uh, Sell-offs, and all of a sudden, instead of uh, infrastructure, uh, public health, uh, other uh, basic needs being provided at subsidized rates to the population, you have uh, privatized uh, owners uh, financed by the banks raising the rates to whatever uh, rate they can get uh, without any market borrowing power. Uh, in the United States, uh, uh, the uh, government is not even allowed to bargain with the uh, pharmaceutical companies for uh, the drug prices. So there's been a huge monopolization, a huge privatization, uh, a huge uh, flooding of the economy with credit, and one person's credit is somebody else's uh, debt. So you, you, you've described the 1% wealth in the form of uh, savings, but uh, I focus on the other side of the balance sheet, this 1% finds its counterpart in the debts of the 99%. So the 1% has got wealthy by indebting the 99% uh, for housing that has soared in price, 20% uh, just in the last year in the United States, uh, for medical care, for uh, utilities, for education. Uh, the economy is being forced increasingly into debt. And how, how can one uh, solve this? Uh, Taxation will not be enough. The only way that you can uh, actually reverse this uh, concentration of wealth is to begin wiping out uh, uh, the debt. If you leave the debt in place uh, of the 99%, uh, then uh, you're going to leave the 1% uh, 
savings all in place. Uh, and these savings are largely tax exempt. Uh, so basically, I think you, you uh, left out the government's role in this wealth creation of the 1%. Your, your finance has indeed grown faster than the economy. Finance has absorbed real estate into the finance, insurance, and real estate sector, the fire sector. Finance has absorbed the oil industry, the mining industry, and it's absorbed most of the government. So uh, the financial wealth has spilled over to become an, uh, essentially the economy's central planner. It's not planned in Washington or uh, Paris or London. It's planned in Wall Street, the city of London, and the Paris ports. Uh, the economy is being managed financially, and the object of financial management isn't really to make money. It's capital gains. Uh, and again, as your statistics point out, capital gains are really what explains the increase in wealth. You don't get rich by saving the income. Uh, rent is for paying interest. Income is for paying interest. You get rich off the government basically subsidizing an enormous increase in the value of stocks, the value of bonds by the central banks, which have been privatized. And uh, the reason that this is occurring is that uh, the largest public utility of all, money creation and banking, is left in private hands, and private banking in the West is very different from what government banking is in, say, China. Uh, government banking would uh, create credit for public uses, for what the economy needs to grow. Uh, in the United States and throughout the West, banks create credit to slow the economy from growing. They uh, make uh, loans only uh, not to create new means of production, new factories, and, uh, uh, and it, they, create, uh, they make loans against property already in place, mainly real estate already in place. 80% of bank loans in America and Europe are for real estate. Uh, they make loans for corporate takeovers. Uh, they make loans uh, to buy uh, other companies they don't make loans to build new factories, which is what uh, uh, a government uh, creation, money creation in, say, China, China would do. So uh, as long as you leave banking and credit in private hands, you're going to have banks creating their product, debt. And the more debt they create, the more debt service that the borrowers, the 99%, have to pay the banks for, uh, in order to obtain a house or an education or medical care, or just to break even. And the more money they pay to the financial sector, the less they have to pay for goods and services. So as the economy polarizes between the 1% and the 99%, the economy as a whole shrinks because more and more of its income is spent not on production uh, and consumption, it's spent just on debt service. So uh, my solution is uh, you have to restore banking and credit in to public hands to prevent the kind of lending that makes asset price inflation. Uh, secondly, uh, you talked about taxing. Some taxes are more important than others. Uh, I don't think that as long as there are, uh, as long as the banks and the financial sector write the tax codes, as long as the government uh, uh, lawmakers are basically employees of the financial sector who finances their political campaigns, uh, you're not going to be able to tax them or to close down the fake uh, uh, transfer pricing that corporations use to pretend not to make money. So uh, you have to tax uh, the uh, source of uh, the money that pays interest to the banks uh, itself. And that source is mainly economic rent. It's land rent. If you would have a tax on uh, a, the increase in land value, if you'd have a, a land tax, which is what the whole 19th century was about, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, uh, Marx, uh, then if you, you would not have this uh, increased rent being paid to the financial sector to be monopolized by the 1%. Uh, so you, you'd have to change the, the way in which the tax code is based away from the overall income and wealth, which is really not very practical in today's political situation. You'd have to have a land tax and a natural resource tax. And to get rid of monopoly rent, you have to return basic key uh, infrastructure to the public domain where it was before 1980, so that uh, basic needs can be supplied at low prices, not uh, creating monopoly for uh, the 1%. Uh, and I guess I'm saying 
you have to realize that finance has used its wealth to take over the economy. And this has to be reversed uh, because uh, once you have uh, wealth taking the form of uh, claim uh, loans and claims on other people's debt, well, com- you have compound interest. Any rate of interest is a doubling time. And compound interest is always going to grow faster than the economy's real growth. And the only way to prevent this isn't simply to lower the interest rate, which you've done today to uh, 0.1%. Uh, the only solution is to wipe out the overall debts that are stopping economic growth. And these debts are the savings of the 1%. The good thing about canceling debts is you cancel the savings of the 1%. And as long as you leave these savings in place, there's not going to be a solution. Thank you so much, Michael. And Toma, feel free to respond to this idea of uh, canceling debt. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't feel I, we have any major uh, uh, disagreement about, uh, you know, everything you, you just said, Michael. Uh, le- let me say also, regarding, you know, my, my book, Capital in the 21st Century, uh, you know, it's a book that has lots of limitation. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, I have on many issues, you know, I'm, I've, I've tried to, 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 to make uh, progress since then. So this was written 10 years ago. I, I wrote Capital and Ideology much more recently, which I think addresses some of the shortcomings. But this is and still this book has also a lot of limitations. So, you know, I'm trying to make progress all the time. And I certainly don't pretend that all the answers are in, uh, are in uh, you know, one book. And that being said, I think, you know, many, many things that you've mentioned, you know, I, uh, again, I fully agree with that. I, as I said, you know, the, the cancellation of debt is is um, is very important because uh, as as you very well said the the part of the increase in private wealth at the top was really made um, through uh, you know privatization of public assets increase in public debt you know there's one one statistic which i which i stress a lot which is that if you look at the net wealth of the public sector uh, you know, the net wealth of the government, so government assets minus government debt. It used to be, you know, in the 1970s, uh, net public wealth was, you know, between 20, 30 percent of total national wealth. So, you know, net private wealth was bigger, you know, was like 70 or 80 percent, but still net public wealth was 20, 30 percent in Germany, in the US, in France, in Britain, uh, in Japan. So that was, you know, substantial part of everything that was to own in terms of, of, uh, of marketable assets uh, in society belong to the public domain, you know, say around one quarter or between one quarter and one third. Today, so, you know, three, four decades later, uh, it is uh, close to zero or actually negative in in uh, in the US or in in the UK, in the sense that the public debt is bigger than the public assets because many public assets were privatized and um, uh, and uh, public debt increased and you know the, 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 in effect there was a transfer of public wealth uh, to to private wealth holders and that's uh, you know that's a very important uh, evolution which you see the, the most extreme case of course will be Russia and post-communist country where you know you just transfer all the public wealth and you make oligarchs uh, out of nothing but in fact we've all you know, all countries have had these kind of trajectories over the, the recent decades. So that's really an important part of the story that I've been uh, trying to tell. So, you know, again, I, I don't think I, uh, we have any disagreement on this. At an even broader level, you know, it's it's all about power and, and, and political institutions. So as you said, you know, as long as the, the system of, uh, of political finance and, you know, parties and campaigns and media and think tank, you know, are largely controlled by, by large wealth holders, uh, you know, our collective ability to change uh, the distribution of wealth and the, the uh, you know, through, through taxation or debt cancellation and all, all what, you know, whatever the method uh, is going to be limited. So it will take major political fight and in some cases, you know, change in the political rules of the game and, and uh, the political institution to, to, to change this. And, and, you know, the good news is that this has always been like this or this has always and, 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 and still sometimes, you know, it has worked in the in the past, but it has worked. You know, I mentioned the French Revolution, you know, of course, that's a huge popular mobilization. Uh, also in the 20th century, I mentioned after World War Two, after World War One. Well, let's be clear. It's only because there was a very powerful, uh, uh, you know, labor movement, a socialist movement, and communist counter model in the East, which in the end put pressure 
uh, on the on the uh, on, on you know on, on the in effect on the elite governing elite in uh, in 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 the West, so that they 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 had to accept a number of decisions, you know, which which were limited in their scope, but still which transform. The, the economic and social system in 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 very substantial way as compared to the pre World War One and 19th century economic system. But it's only through this enormous uh, political mobilization and collective organization. And you know it will be the same in in the past. So just one last point. You know you mentioned the the case of um, China, and you know I think the Chinese counter model can can contribute maybe in the future also to sort of put pressure on the West to 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 change our system. Also at this stage, you know, we are not, um, you know, the, the, the big difference, of course, with the Soviet counter model is that the Soviet counter model, you know, you had a, 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 a sort of a narrative uh, and, and, a, and a proximity between socialist and communist party and the labor movement so that in, in effect, the, the elite in the West felt threatened by the by the by this counter model, and this contributed to reinforce, uh, to some extent, uh, until a certain point, uh, the labor movement in the in the in the West. Well, until the final fall of the Soviet Union, which of course reinforced a lot, uh, uh, you know, uh, hyper capitalist ideology and and the, and and everything we've seen uh, since then. Uh, the Chinese model, you know, you mentioned the fact that the banking system is, is, is working a bit more to the service of the real economy and infrastructure and investments than, than the banking system in the West. But by and large, you know, the Chinese uh, model, um, uh, you know, looks more and more like a sort of perfect uh, digital uh, dictatorship. And, uh, you know, nobody really wants to, <laughs> to, to copy this. And, you know, apart from uh, other government uh, elite, you know, would like to, 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 you know, to keep quiet their population and their uh, grassroots movement as efficiently as uh, the Beijing regime is doing. But apart from, you know, no, no, nobody in the world, you know, no, no collective movement in the world wants to, wants to look like this. So this also limits uh, the, 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 sort of the pressure that the, this, this counter model can, can put on, uh, and 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 the and the West, but you know, at the end of the day, I think this can be one of the forces which still can induce. Uh, for instance, you know, when we talk about the taxation of multinational in 2021, which uh, you know what has been decided by rich countries, you know, is very limited. You know, they claim they have solved the problem of uh, multinational taxation, but it's uh, it's a bit ridiculous how little they have done. The, the minimum tax rate of 15% is ridiculously small. And also, it's only sort of sharing, sort of rich countries are sharing between themselves, you know, the, the, the tax base that is currently in, in tax haven, but countries in the South, in the global South, basically don't get anything. And I think that's an, that's an issue, that's an, an area in which the, the pressure of the Chinese counter model in the future maybe will contribute to induce uh, uh, rich countries to, 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 to have a, a, a bit more, uh, you know, uh, inclusive attitude towards uh, the, the South. Also, while, while if they don't do it, I mean, you know, if they don't do it, uh, in effect, China will will finance the investment and the, the infrastructure investment that is needed in uh, Africa and in South Asia. And, and that's, that's, you know, this is, uh, at, at some point, uh, you know, hopefully uh, Western countries will realize that they, they have to change something, otherwise they will, they will just lose any, any, uh, any influence and any capacity to influence the uh, the world, yeah. Um, okay, so this is getting us very far from the initial uh, discussion, but uh, uh, I hope this is still more or less uh, relevant. Michael, yeah. feel free to respond. Well, it would not surprise me if we end up in agreement uh, with what to do. Uh, and I realize that uh, uh, you wrote your book about your topic, and I wrote my book about what to do about it. I just want to uh, point out where I think we do have, have a disagreement. Uh, my point is that compound interest is always going to grow faster than the economy's uh, real ability to grow. So in the end, debts can't be paid. Right now, you see a lot of third world debts that uh, if the third world debtor countries have to pay uh, their foreign debts uh, under as the world economy slows down, they're going to be subject 
to austerity, to the World Banks and uh, the IMF's uh, austerity programs, and they're going to be kept in poverty. Uh, is it really right that they should be kept in poverty just to enrich the bondholders of the 1%? The 1% will say, yes, that's why we're the 1%, so that we can impoverish other people. That's our liberty. Our liberty is the right to impoverish other people and reduce them to dependency. Uh, that will happen if you do not write down the debts. Uh, it's already happening in the United States to the student debt. Uh, crisis where students uh, have to pay so much money uh, as they fall behind on their student debts that they can't afford to take out mortgages to buy homes, uh, and you're having the home ownership rates plunge in the United States. That's the result of leaving the debts in place. Uh, the mortgage debts uh, 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 are, are causing shrinkage, so there is no way to get out of this economic polarization without uh, a debt write down. And that's something that's, that's too radical. And uh, uh, when we talked about, uh, when I was referring to what China's doing, I'm referring to what it's doing today and tomorrow about uh, the uh, real estate company Evergrande. Uh, uh, China ha uh, has a choice. Is it going to leave Evergrande's real estate debts? in place, and Evergrande uh, as a real estate company is two to 3% of the entire Chinese economy. If it pays the foreign creditors and the domestic 1% of China, it's going to impoverish the, uh, the employees of Evergrande. It's going to make housing prices more and more expensive in China. China has had a debt financed housing boom. Uh, if you leave the debts in place, then uh, you're, you're going to impoverish China. And obviously, China is going to say, I'm, we're not going to put the creditors first. We're not going to do what the West does and say the sanctity of debt service, debts are, uh, uh, that you owe are sacred. Uh, we, it's worth sacrificing the economy. It's worth plunging the economy into poverty just to preserve the wealth of the 1%. I think China uh, is going to make the opposite decision and say, we're not going to commit political suicide. We're going to operate for, it's a socialist economy, and when it comes to debt and credit, thank God we have our banking in the public domain. And since the public domain, the uh, People's Bank of China, is the creditor, it can afford to write down the debt without having any political backlash because it's canceling debt so to itself, uh, which is a great advantage. Uh, and it's also, uh, as for the private bondholders, uh, it's going to say, well, sorry, bondholders, you made loans to a company that was way over leveraged. Uh, already, uh, the American bond rating companies have reduced their bond rating to chunk. So you knew what you were buying. If you continued to hold bonds that uh, Fitch and other bond raters, Moody's, all say are chunk, and you lose your money, well, you took the risk. You got a high rate of interest. Now you're, you're paying the price. That's how markets work. Uh, and uh, that really uh, is the argument. And I think uh, you have to, uh, obviously, what I'm suggesting is a radical step, just as you're suggesting of taxing wealth would require the radical step of closing down offshore banking centers, of simply negating uh, if, if uh, banks would simply erase all of the deposits they have from the offshore banking centers, from the Cayman Islands, from, from Panama. From, uh, from Liberia to all the places that began by, to be set up by the mining companies, the oil companies, and then were set up uh, beginning in the 1960s, uh, essentially by the CIA to finance the Vietnam War by making America, uh, like England, uh, the home for criminal capital, for flight capital. All this, uh, all this flight capital and the kleptocracy that you mentioned in Russia, all this really should be wiped out. And if you leave this capital, if you leave this 1% in place, the economy is going to be sacrificed and shrinking. Is it worth shrinking the economy just to leave the 1% in place? And if you challenge them, that's pretty radical. That's really what I think Marx would say today. Um, thank you. And uh, I, I wanted to just pitch a question to you all before we turn over uh, it over to some questions from the audience. Um, you've both mentioned it's, it's not the elephant in the room. It's sort of the Tyrannosaurus Rex in the room. I think, Tama, as you put it, those who should pay design the system. Uh, you both have commented on this enormous problem that we have. Every time we have good ideas ranging from just a tiny little tax on the rich 
you know, to the more radical ideas that Michael is suggesting, we run up against this Tyrannosaurus Rex. So where do you all see the most effective pressure points coming from right now um, in, in terms of getting anything accomplished on debt? Where, where is the effective mobilization potentially coming from or that you see developing now? Mm. So maybe let, let me first say, you know, we need debt cancellation. You know, we need a, a regular debt cancellation. I, 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 don't, I don't think at all this is uh, radical or too radical. If anything, you know, I think this is not radical enough because I think in addition to debt cancellation, we need also to redistribute the assets, to redistribute wealth. And so when I'm talking about taxing wealth, it's also redistributing wealth. So giving wealth to people who don't own anything. So it's not only cancelling their debt, it's also giving them positive uh, ownership rights in, in companies, in housing. So, so yeah, we, we, I think there's no, really no, no disagreement on this. Now, uh, what about, you know, the, the pressures that will come? Well, two, two things. First, you know, I think the, the real problem is the system of free capital flow. So, you know, the idea that you can, um, you know, we have created an international legal system where, in effect, we have sacralized we have an almost sacralized right, you know, to, to you, you accumulate wealth in a country using the public infrastructure, the education system, you know, the health system of a country. And then you can push on a button, transfer your assets in another jurisdiction, and nobody knows where you are, nobody. And But, but you know, there's nothing natural in this system. This was made by a set of international treaties, a particular legal system, and, and that's just not, this can uh, we so individual countries i think you know have to get to get rid of that and so in the case of europe you know you cannot wait for unanimity to get rid of that so individual countries have to say okay you know i'm not against the circulation of investment and capital goods but it has to come with uh, a, a common taxation with common uh, regulation common rules you know this cannot just be like this you know you push on a button we don't know where you are so this has to 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 go uh, um, so you know some proposals that were made by like bernie sanders in the in the presidential campaign in in, in the us last year early last year this seems like ages ago but this was only uh, 18 months ago uh, you know when he said okay we you know you can if you want to escape uh, my federal wealth tax you can go away but then you will uh, have to pay a 40 percent exit tax you know you will have to, to keep 40 percent of your assets in the us if you want to go ahead you know that's clearly a big change as compared to free capital flow and but that's the kind of change we we need to you know, we need we need to we need to consider. So, how is this going to happen? Well, first, we need to realize that you know the free capital flows treaty agreement, which came a lot actually, in fact, from Europe in the 1980s, but also from Washington, of course. But it was a co-production, if you want. Uh, with this, has to go, and individual countries have to to escape that. Uh, other other source of change and pressure. You know, I think climate change is going to put a strong pressure in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, I think when people see more and more uh, uh, catastrophic uh, climatic events, you know, I think attitudes toward globalization and attitudes toward uh, inequality in general, you know, can change very quickly because at, you know, at some point, I think people will not find it funny at all uh, to have all these billionaires, uh, you know, giving lessons, uh, using their private jet, uh, doing uh, space tourism, uh, uh, etc. You know, at some point, you know, I think nobody is going to find this funny at all and, and there can be a very quick and, and fast, you know, complete change in attitude following this. And, you you know, I think the Ch Chinese sort of counter model with all its good and bad, very bad sometimes aspects uh, can also be, be a factor of change. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Michael, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I don't see a change within the existing system. I guess that makes uh, me radical. Uh, 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 so Thomas did not mention the main point that he made in his book which was uh, his number one suggestion was tax inherited wealth because most wealth is inherited. That's one of the things that he's found. Absolutely right. Great idea. Saint Simon, uh, the great French uh, economist, had this idea in the very first book he wrote around 1806. Uh, it made him very unpopular, and he soon realized that that's one. There was no way of doing that. Uh, from Saint Simon on to the entire. 19th century of British political and French political economy. 
They all agreed uh, with Smith and uh, the others. You have to, uh, there's a landlord tax. The, the 1% in their day were the landlords. You have to tax away the land rent and make that the public uh, tax base, not income, not uh, taxes on uh, consumer goods, not taxes on capital, because you want good capital investment. You want fortunes to be made in a good way that add to the economy's productivity. You don't want them to be made in a predatory, bad way. Uh, the whole fight to tax economic rent and to even recognize that uh, most income is unearned. When you talk about uh, the uh, income disparity, almost all this disparity is unearned income. It's economic rent. It's not income that's made by increasing uh, production. It's not income that's made by increasing living standards. It's just predatory rent seeking from special privileges that the wealthy have uh, gained from government. And today it's not the landlord class anymore as it was in the 19th century. It's the financial class and the raw materials class. Uh, and uh, without uh, dealing uh, with this, uh, uh, structure, I don't, uh, the system is going to shrink and shrink. And we've seen this before. We saw it in Rome. The same kind of uh, polarization and concentration of wealth in the Roman Empire. Well, the last stage of that is feudalism. So we're back to what Rosa Luxemburg said, the choices between socialism and barbarism, basically. And uh, uh, there, there's no other way to do it. You can't solve the problems within the existing system because it's controlled already by the 1%. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I'd like to toss out a couple of questions from the audience now. Uh, we have a question about energy. Uh, one viewer asks, isn't energy as much a source of value as land? Should we have progressive taxes on energy use as well or instead of land value tax? Uh, first of all, land doesn't have any value, nor does uh, energy have any value. We're talking about economic rent. So par part of the financial sectors use part of its uh, uh, income to uh, subsidize economic schools and universities to change the vocabulary. Our vocabulary is different from the realistic vocabulary that we had in the 19th century. Land doesn't really have a value. Nature creates it. A value is created by people working and creating it. Uh, but nature provides uh, the land and the public sector's spending on infrastructure creates the rent of location, which increases land prices. Nature provides uh, the oil. So uh, economic rent is what we're talking about. And this economic rent uh, of uh, land and uh, oil and minerals and monopolies belongs in the public domain so that you don't have to have an income tax and uh, uh, excise taxes and value added taxes on labor uh, and industry. You should tax the rentiers not labor and industry. That's, that's what a free market meant in the 19th century. And it means inverted. Today, a free market is the right for the rentiers to avoid taxes and shift the entire tax base onto labor and industry. And they do this by uh, twisting around and perverting the English language to get rid of the analytic language that you need to even explain how some in most income and most wealth is unearned. Uh, how about you, Tamad? Do you think that we need to clarify how we talk about and define value? Yeah, well, you know, in the case of energy, uh, first we have to clarify the fact that, you know, there are some sources of energy which, uh, which create a negative uh, value because of, of, uh, of, uh, of global uh, climate change and climate warming and, warming and, you know, all the negative uh, uh, external effect of using some energy. So we have some, to make some of the energy uh, sources uh, just illegal. You know, we have to keep some of the oil uh, in the ground. We have to stop uh, looking for new oil and gas so you know so, so the solution to, to some of the of the energy questions we have is just to 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 make illegal you know the use of, of certain energy and to 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 move to other energy so that's part of the answer now if we if we have done that and we deal with with uh, with energies that don't have the the, the, the negative uh, this much bigger negative impact on mankind than, than their positive uh, productive impact then you know redistribution 
of wealth must be about all forms of wealth, you know, whether it's uh, rent or uh, energy or financial assets or housing, you know, we, we need to have a, circ a permanent circulation of wealth and power. So, you know, that's the way I, I view, you know, ta ta taxation of wealth is will be a permanent, uh, you know, progressive uh, 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 tax on net wealth, which in effect will will uh, will wipe out all the biggest uh, wealth right away you know say up to 90% tax per year for you know for 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 millionaires but among you know there will still be some people who own 100,000 dollars some people who own 1 million uh, or 2 million but there will be a permanent circulation of of wealth holdings within uh, within this uh, limited uh, uh, wealth gap that that will still uh, exist and this should be for all forms of wealth you know whether it's land or housing or what, whatever the, whatever the origin thank you uh we ha seem to have quite a number of students in the audience today so we have a question about student debt and what types of resistance uh students could make to uh to change the social relationship of debt that they get forced into um do you have any suggestions on rhetorical points that students need to engage with um, in, in order to gain support for a, a debt jubilee on their debts. Michael, you want to? I wish there were. I don't see any because uh, the uh, you have a president of the United States who wrote the law saying that you're not allowed to wipe out student debt as a result of bankruptcy. Uh, the, uh, the Basic, the American philosophy is the way to prevent uh, uh, a middle class from developing is to keep them uh, basically so deeply indebted that uh, they're afraid they have to go to work. They're afraid to leave their jobs. Uh, they can't afford houses. The, the purpose of student debt is to make them dependent. Under socialism on, on, in Europe, China, and uh, the all, old countries, uh, education was free. And the whole idea was uh, it's, you need education in order to grow. Uh, under the finance capitalist system, and this is not industrial capitalism anymore. This is financial capitalism, very different. It, you use a basic need as a means of saying your money or your life. If you don't pay us, uh, then uh, you'll, you'll just have to forego your education. So the price of uh, getting access to a labor force is to go so deeply into debt that you're going to have to work for a living and you're going to have to work for what we pay you. There's a class war on and you got to realize that. And there's very little you can do with students because if you don't, I, uh, right now, I guess if you all stop paying the debt, uh, make the government for, uh, throw uh, 20 million of you in jail, they can't do it. Uh, the only thing to do, I guess, would be a strike. But in the meanwhile, they're going to uh, try to uh, go after your credit rating. They're going to try to uh, uh, fight you. you. You have to back politicians who are willing to change this. And unfortunately, there is no party that's uh, in favor of canceling student debt or any kind of debt in the United States because the political parties are subsidized by the banking and the financial sector. So uh, I, don't see, uh, I don't see a way out. Thomas? Yeah, well, I agree with Michael that with this government and with this president in the US, you know, it's probably going to be difficult to get a, a lot going. But and, and I also agree that the entire political system in the US, in a way, is so corrupt by money and the, the way uh, uh, campaigns are financed and, you know, the way media also are financed and are biased in the way they cover the different possible candidates. This makes it very difficult. That being said, uh, again, if we go back to uh, 18 months ago, uh, you know, there, there were candidates in the, in the Democratic primary, uh, which... Uh, you know, uh, together, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, I mean, I don't put them exactly together, of course, but but they had a substantial share of the vote. And on the issue of student debt, you know, I think different things could have happened with a, with a different president and a different uh, a majority. So I think it's it's important also to 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 be helpful and to try to prepare you know what will be a more successful um, coalition or a more successful political campaign uh, uh, in the future and it's important to always remember that as as michael was saying the true source of economic prosperity is not uh, financial capitalism it is uh, investment in education investment in the real economy in infrastructure and you know when 
the, the, in the middle of the 20th century, in the 1950s, 1960s, when the U.S. had, had uh, were in a situation of, uh, of uh, economic dominance over the rest of the world, it was not through uh, extreme financial inequality. You know, you had 90% top income tax rate uh, after Roosevelt, and, but you had a big educational advance. Uh, as compared to, you know, at that time, you had uh, uh, 90% of, uh, of a cohort will go to high school in the U.S. in 1950s, 1960s. Uh, uh, at the same time, it was 20, 30% uh, in Germany or in France. Or, so, and, and this was this educational advance which made prosperity historically and 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 we seem to to have forgotten this uh, you know in the US uh, following you know since the 1980s but so we we have to manage to put this back on the on, on this agenda but that's that's of course that's not uh, that's not easy well, thank you very much to uh, both of our speakers today. I think you've helped open our minds and, and think about this topic um, a little more clearly, uh, even though we're still not exactly sure how to overcome these um, tremendous forces uh, that are working against us to find solutions that uh, really at the end of the day, I don't think anything either one of you has said is truly radical in the sense of history. I mean, we have... As human beings, we have approached and, and uh, confronted these problems before, and there have been good practical solutions uh, that both of you have offered. So I wanted to just turn the floor over to Professor Steve King now. And uh, again, thank you everyone for uh, participating in this conversation today. Thank you for our speakers and thank you for the audience as well. I'm sorry that there was only one hour, so there's been over 70 questions asked. We'd be here for three hours trying to answer them. So we've took a couple out to make it uh, make it worthwhile. Uh, I think we want to particularly thank Thomas for being part of this debate, because one thing Michael and I have experienced so frequently is that we can't get uh, anybody in the establishment to join into discussions with us outside the establishment. And I really respect you and honour you for, for doing that. And it also shows the tremendous contribution that David made by being somebody who can talk to everybody and everybody enjoys talking to David. We hope we can maintain that through the idea of forthcoming debates and we look forward to seeing you all there in the future installments in the Fight Club. So thank you, everybody.